Okay, um, so far in chapter four, we have that Dwight and is back and Peter's back. They're all at the house again. They're all staying over. Moore's there too. And Dwight, um, Mary's very funny. Mary, of course, wants everyone to get out of the house because she thinks they all have measles. So she turns to Dwight. She's like, I suppose you'd want to go to church. And he's like, yeah, sure. I, I guess I'd like to go to church. And so um, Maura knows where it is. So she offers to go. And, and he says, oh, do you go off? And she's like, not once in a blue moon. Um, and he goes, oh, okay. Uh, so it's it's interesting that we have, you know, Maura, the hot mess DJ, is really starting to become somebody who's, who's really very interesting and really very um, soulful and thoughtful. She still has little, little instances where she can be kind of destructive or snarky. Um, Mary pulls Peter aside and they start talking about these two trees that are in the background or, or the backyard. And she's like, do you think we can pull down these trees? And Peter goes, why? And she's like, well, from here to here, I'd like to have all those trees cleared out so we can just grow all of those vegetables. And then maybe right here, we could have a gum tree. Gum trees take about five years to bloom. And Peter even says that. And she's like, yeah, uh, all right. It'll be nice to know that, you know, that's gonna happen. And he goes, okay, sure, and they're walking away, and Mary Moira turns to Dwight, and she says, someone's crazy. And um, he kind of chides her a little bit for that, and he says, you know, don't go and spoil it for them. He's like, maybe maybe they're living in denial, maybe they don't care, maybe they're just setting things up for the future, maybe they think they can take it with them, like they're Egyptian pharaohs or something. It's, it's not yours to ruin. So um, Peter then tells him that they've been receiving interesting radio transmissions that somewhere out there in Uruguay near Montevideo, they have heard what sounds like Morse code coming through, but the person or whatever is operating this, this radio doesn't actually know Morse code. Um, and they know that it's, it's got to be not just regular because it comes on irregularly and the beeps and the dashes are irregular. So it leads them to believe like something, something's up. I'd like you to come in with a printout of Morse code. So Mora invites Dwight back to her farm, uh, where he interacts with with um, his, the dad more than than the mom. And it's kind of nice because we get to see another side of of the domestic life. And I, I think it's one that Dwight is a little bit more comfortable in. Not that he's uncomfortable with Peter and Mary and the baby, of course, but th there is a little bit more of of an older man to Dwight than there is to Peter. And he gets to interact with with uh, Mr. Davidson, Maura's father, and they, they kind of sit back and they have whiskeys and they talk. Meanwhile, we jump back over to Peter's house and um, we start to see that Mary is really very interested in the baby and how the baby is progressing. And, you know, she's she's a little worried because, um, you know, here on page 126 and 127, she's noticing that the baby is, is starting to crawl quite a bit and she's worried about its safety. Uh, and, and I just use the pronoun it because Neville Shoot on page 127 uses the pronoun it quite a bit as well. And I'm not really sure if this makes me comfortable or uncomfortable. Here it is. Uh, Okay, they're, they're discussing options with they can't get a playpen, and Peter, of course, glibly says we can tie a belt around her waist and keep her on a leash. And Mary goes, no, we're not going to do that. Um, he mollified her, accustomed to the charge of being a heartless father. They spent the next hour playing with their baby on the grass in the warm sun, encouraging it to crawl about the lawn. Finally, Mary took it indoors to bathe it and give it its supper, while Peter went on sawing up the logs. It's a she is the pronoun you're supposed to be using, but I'm not sure who's attributing that pronoun to the baby. Is that Neville Shoot? Is that Peter? Is that Mary? So that's your question for tonight, for this part, is who gave the baby the pronoun it? Neville Shoot, the author, Peter, the father, or Mary, the mother? This is, this is the last part of the book that I'll discuss. We start to get into what, what they term the Jorgensen effect. Professor Jorgensen, now Nicole asked a great question. She's like, I don't, I don't understand how the gas isn't just falling or isn't it going somewhere. It's, it's very difficult to understand this. Um, there are air streams, just like there are gulf streams, and they don't go in perfect condescending order from northern hemisphere to southern hemisphere. They, they go in these circuitous routes and they move around and sometimes they diverge and sometimes they, they merge into something and depending on how cold and hot the air is and high and low the air pressure is, that is how the air will travel. So it is slowly and gradually coming down but they'll get little gusts that move it over or dissipate it or, or move it around. Um, and Professor Jorgensen actually argues that there's a chance that it's not coming now. So he has, and here it is, page uh, 128, and this is, I believe, John Osborne explaining it. Wishful thinking. 
There's a school of thought among the scientists, a section of them, who consider that this atmospheric radioactivity may be dissipating, decreasing in intensity fairly quickly. The general argument is that the precipitation during the last winter in the northern hemisphere, the rain and the snow, may have washed the air, so to speak. The American nodded. According to that theory, the radioactive elements in the atmosphere will be falling to the ground or to the sea more quickly than we had anticipated. In that case, the ground masses of the northern hemisphere would continue to be uninhabitable for many centuries, but the transfer of radioactivity to us would be progressively decreased. In that case, life, human life, might continue to go on down here, or at any rate in Antarctica. Professor Jorgensen holds to that view very strongly, and they call it the Jorgensen effect. Um, no one really believes this. And I'm going to ask you if this is grasping at straws. And I don't even need to throw up a placard. You're smart. You know that this is grasping at straws. Um, people use science all the time to try and comfort themselves when they know that the facts are against them. And, you know, cards are, cards are stacked against you. You're, you're not going to win on this one. So they're, they're just trying to figure out a way. You're, you're a clever, intelligent human being. Um, can rain wash something like radioactivity out of the air? I mean, think about it. If you go outside and you put a helium balloon up and you let it go, even if it's raining, that helium balloon will still go up. That's because the helium still rises. Now let's pop the balloon. Does the helium then get washed out of the air? No. The rain molecules, the water molecules, are not going to interact with the helium, break apart, form new bonds, and then drag them down to Earth at a heavier percentage than what helium is. Helium, of course, rises and rain falls. H2O is heavy. Um, but that, that's asinine. You're smart. You know that. And this would be a great question to, to go ahead and ask a science teacher if you are taking um, science or forensic science or anything fun like that. Go right ahead and ask, like, is there anything to the Jorgensen effect? That's, that's a fascinating little question. Peter is about to go out on, on the second cruise, and it's a very long second cruise. And what he's worried about is, of course, like what, what happens if, if his wife Mary and Jennifer start to get sick while he's away. Because they are kind of starting to cut it close. We, we are coming to the zero hour, and he's about to go get on a boat and go off on this, this tour, which would have been one period of time, except they just found out about the radio, so now it's going to be this additional period of time. So he's quite worried. Um, and he has gone to a pharmacy to see if there's any way he can get some help or if there's any way that the government has decided to ease people's passages. And there is, actually. Uh, the pharmacist gives him a dummy kit to, to basically end your life. Um, and, of course, I'm not advocating anything. I'm simply saying this is inside the book, written by Neville Shute, not by Emory Donahue. Um, and inside the dummy kit is, is you know, a hypodermic needle and poison that will end someone's life in a peaceful, dignified way because the way that these people are going to die from radioactivity is, is not peaceful. It's, it's going to be very traumatic. It's, it's a very upsetting and unpleasant death and the logic in the book would be, wouldn't it be, we've been living in this nice, peaceful, dignified manner to our death. Why don't we just continue to take death into that nice, dignified end and then see what is on the other side, you know, if, if, if the gray ships that Gandalf have promised us are there. So um, th that's to be considered. Uh, of course, you don't have to consider it because it's not going to happen, but this is, this is inside of a book. Um, and Peter takes that and he, he's like, you know, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'll take it home and I'll explain it to my wife, but I don't know if she's going to know to come here and get it. And the pharmacist, much like the man who delivers the milk and the cream, says, I'll make sure Mrs. Holmes has, has a box and understands what to do with it. And I, I thought, wow, this is, this is really nice. And I know that a lot of you, like David, and, and a lot of you are, are thinking that this is a very dull, very unaction-packed book. I'm going to challenge you. Should it have been action-packed? Isn't this the way people should behave when something traumatic happens, pulling together? When the tornado hit, you didn't turn into, you know, crazy renegade Mad Max people, like Quentin had said. Um, you actually turned into good, strong people. We have kids from Chog out cutting logs and cleaning people's, you know, um, when I change, lawns and everything, and, and you were helping the elderly, and you were helping uh, people who, who needed help. And, and I'm going to challenge you, why, why do you want your end of the world literature to be completely fantastical when the, the end of the world literature from Australia is, is very realistic? Um, so that's my final question. 
So placard up, why, why do Americans want end of the world literature to be so dramatic uh, and, and to basically refute reality? Come on, lights, come on back on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lights. Oh my God, these things are freaking driving me crazy. Okay, that is all you're gonna get for chapter four from On the Beach. I will see you Monday. Please write the answers down on a nice piece of paper. I'm not accepting anything that's coming off of like a half torn off sheet or a post-it note. I'm, I'm just not taking that because it's too much of a mess, okay? All right, don't text and drive. I will see you Monday. Be very safe. Bye-bye. DJ, you're right in the hallway now, as always.